So first, we got to get in. We got to get into the, the moth to the flame. We got to get in. So the first snippet is about going in. And I'm going in with another colleague, and I'm going into Baghdad, and I'm going in in 1991. Okay. Perfectly what you would expect I had written in my diary, Joe, my colleague, as that piece of paper settling to earth, one day eventually, oh, as a, to blacken and curl in the fire. And me, his boss, under gray skies, gunpowder in the air, all Tennyson, despite, despite what had befallen me in Vietnam. We left according to script, that same adrenaline flow that went through you whenever you crossed that line into terra incognita. A four-wheel drive, a Jordanian driver, Joe and I, now leaving the outskirts of Amman at 9 p.m. and bound for Baghdad. Thirteen hours, I said to Joe, if we get through. But as I said, jo Joe didn't know about these details. He just knew this is what he did. And soon enough, his eyes had closed and his legs had curled up, while I, as ever in search of incandescence, was as wide-eyed as the deer in the headlights and wouldn't, have, and wouldn't have been able to miss a second. At times like this, there is an otherworldly quiet in the car, just some occasional sounds from Joe as he turned in his sleep, the lights in the dash, the road is unrelieved, a straight hard surface across the bleak hamada. The silhouette of a dog howling, and you are alone. There is no traffic but you. It was what I had done before in South Lebanon and what I would do again in Bel Belgrade. It was a lonely venture into a battlefield in the wake of a large scale killing. No traffic, no lights, either off in the scrub <coughs> or on the hard scrabble. Balls to the wall, Joe said. He had sat up and was rubbing the sleep from his eyes, which when I came to think about it was almost supernatural. A moment later, out of that desolate trek had slowly appeared a string of low watt lights across the hard surface and the shadows of men shifting between some outbuildings. As you can imagine, both of us were getting very alert at this juncture. America had just spent the previous few weeks trying to incinerate this ancient land of the Tigris and Euphrates. And once again, here we were, the emissaries of that same destructive force, daring to drive up to this border crossing into Iraq and put our pale faces in front of these Iraqi guards. I don't know, perhaps they didn't care, either way. I still tend to be taken aback that seemingly, regardless of circumstances, for some, it's often business as usual. I mean the paunches, the dead eyes, the glass of tea, and the pack of smokes, the slow, laborious inspection of the pages, the calling of the supervisor to also some thumb through the pages. Just Joe and I sitting there under the moon in the cold Hamada, with me doing my damnedest to affect a respectful nonchalance, and Joe just coming by it naturally, sort of twiddling our thumbs on the edge of the unknown. If we chose to be rational, sitting there and shooting the breeze in the cold night air, odds were that we were not worth hurting, and probably worth listening to. But when thousands of dog-faced Iraqi soldiers have just been mowed down by Yankee gunships like wheat, wheat at harvest, then when you think on it, it may happen that some grieved brother or sister might just walk up to us there on our bench, normal as could be, and once in front of us, as we look up at her, just raise a revolver and blow our brains out. Certainly, it was not like walking through the dead in the aftermath of Gettysburg. Not in Baghdad, that is. It was rather those cement slabs and re-rod, collapsed like mushrooms, as Joe used to say, 
that in the stillness of a city without life, without circulation and movement, and into which Joe and I drove, up and down dead streets, occasionally coming upon people picking through the rubble or scavenging for woods. Here and there, there was a light bulb working off a generator or a pan of coals heating some tea or kebab. These were the first days of traumatization before degraded life in this nation became normal and decapitalization, as the euphemism went, began on a massive scale. It had been most unusual, our meeting with Minister Saha. It was a modern and steel glass construction, undamaged, but without electricity. So here we found ourselves, Joe and me, sitting in the lobby of the building with some guards milling about and twilight upon us. By nightfall, these two lackeys with flashlights had appeared out of a side door sort of like the headlights of a car into the lobby and signaled for us to follow. And then the four of us had begun to as begun the ascent up the barren stairwell with these monstrous shadows being cast by the flashlights, moving up toward the minister nine flights away, with Joe and me looking at each other quite circumspect as we followed the lights up the well. It was an easy place to imagine the worst. What with the shadows dancing around us and our two escorts grim and uncommunicative. Quite relieved as it turned out when we reached the eighth floor and saw a side door into the stairwell opening and light being admitted, followed by another functionary also going up, nodding to our escorts and then looking down at us on us without comment. This counselor had done foreign relations for a country with a half a million men under arms and enough fossil fuel under ancient land to keep it prosperous for eternity. And now we, two persons of little significance, were being ushered into his cabinet with one, with no one waiting before us, nor none after. I remember distinctly it was a black cable that had carried light to our discussion. A short talk, I recall accompanied by the hum of the diesel generator, apparently stuck in the room next door. His nerves were frayed. I had seen this before and knew to recognize it. This man who, pract who had practiced diplomacy in foreign capitals was now so strung out, it was an embarrassment for us to watch him try to get a light to his cigarette or the demitasse to his mouth. All the while, his eyes avoiding ours very quick and furtive, as if an important call were coming momentarily. The terms were familiar, just a different application. I had told Joe we would truck in from Aqaba, food and medicines, on condition we could target and monitor their delivery to all victims, to include Kurd and Shia alike. All told, we had argued it would be a pipeline outside of Saddam's secret manipulation or none at all. Please understand, I had said, we represent millions in the United States and we are preparing a humane response to those in need. We are hoping from an office in Baghdad to draw America's attention and resources toward repair and healing. But he was not paying attention. We were very small fry and he had damn well been around enough to know we would be lucky enough to deliver a fraction of what we were claiming. In, this, in the end, I suppose we got time with him, either because he thought we might be bearing an official message, or, or because he had nothing else to do, or perhaps even had, as Joe had offered, because we were the only ones who would walk up nine flights of stairs. Anyway, finally he had agreed to sign an accord along the lines we presented, although I suspected that he was too frazzled to be counted on. Not, I guess, because of this national catastrophe, but more probably because Saddam was, at that very moment, circling the wagons, and this, dipl and this diplomat, I suppose, was not sure whether he was inside 
the circle or not. So that's 